Hello everyone, my name is Trickiwi, but you can call me Tricky. It's definitely been a while, but I have missed you guys so very much and I am so happy to be making content again. I did have to take a hiatus for mental health reasons. If you want to know more details, I have something in the description below. But if you're new here, welcome to the channel. We are back and there's so much stuff in store. Anyway, back to topic. I've always been super interested in mythology and I've actually done other creepy mythology Pokemon videos in the past and I wanted more. Today we're going to be covering the orange of all of the mythical Pokemon and a lot of them actually have some backstories that I never even would have expected from them when it comes to mythology and stuff like that and to make things even more fun I am not alone today today I'll be joined by mystic Umbreon another fellow content creator who loves Pokemon and we're gonna tell you all the stuff there are a few mythical Pokemon that have zero mythological background but we're still gonna cover every single mythical today be sure to subscribe leave a like and turn on the little bell notification thingy so now let's get started. Here's Mystic. Hey guys, I'm Mystic. These Pokemon all have some pretty unique lore about them, yeah. and even some fascinating information as where they got their strength. Yeah. Speaking of strength, over on my channel, we actually rank the mythical Pokemon Fumikus' strongest, so be sure to head over there when you're done here if you're interested in seeing how well these Pokemon stack up. Yeah. So we've got to start with the very first mythical we ever got as Pokemon fans, Mew. Essentially, Mew is based off of an embryo, with a dash of house cat thrown in. It makes a lot of sense that Game Freak went and made their very first mythical Pokemon into something that can resemble a baby in the womb, since it's the very beginning of things. In the lore, it is the common ancestor of all Pokemon, which makes a ton of sense considering its ability to learn all TMs and use Transform. Personally, I think there is some validity in the theory that Mew is a reference to the recapitulation theory. The what the huh? That basically shows that Mew is what all Pokemon look like at the start of their evolution process. So, say you have a Bulbasaur egg. Well, as it's developing in there, it probably looked like Mew at the very start, and slowly started to look like the Bulbasaur that ends up hatching. It's really interesting, and I think it's viable to believe Game Freak had biological mythology in mind when creating Mew. The next Pokemon we have is that wonderful onion fairy, Celebi. Celebi is the first mythical that was based off of mythology. Celebi may have been based off of the Kodama, which is a Japanese tree fairy. To this day, I really wish that Celebi would have acquired the fairy type in Gen 6, but you know, we can't always get what we want. So according to legend, the Kodama isn't always super sweet and friendly. Some of them could appear to look like a normal tree, and if somebody tried to cut it down or damage the tree, they would immediately get cursed. And there are some occurrences if you cut down one of these trees, blood would squirt all out of it. That's lovely. The old myth was considered to be very mysterious and supernatural. There's been a lot of stories that even say that they look more like ghosts or beasts or something like that and can even take the form of a human. The Kodama can also be classified as a yokai, which is a supernatural monster from Japanese folklore. There's all kinds of different kinds of these little guys. There's a lot of nice ones and there's a lot of bad ones. And some of the folklore even suggests that they are Onis, which is a Japanese demon. We love evil demon freaking onion fairies here. There's been many shrines that were made for the Kodama. This can also point to the Elix Forest Shrine, which is ironically a place where people go to get good luck. So I guess according to legend, if you would mess up the shrine, it will explode in blood or you're gonna get cursed forever. So um, that's something that Pokemon never told us. And really quick, Selby also takes inspiration from the Dryad or Dryad. Oh my god, my southern ass. They are basically little tree spirits from Greek mythology. But anyway, let's go ahead and move Move on before I talk about this for another billion years. Jirachi time! Being called the Wish Pokemon is pretty fitting for a Pokemon like Jirachi, as just looking at its design, you can see a star. Well, what do you do when you see a star, especially one that's shooting by in the night sky? You make a wish. I wish for unlimited food. Plus, being a still type, it builds into Jirachi being based off of a meteorite as well. Its head has those three strips of paper on them as well, which is a reference to the Tanabata, which is a festival in Japan that celebrates the meaning of the deities Orihime and Hikoboshi. And they're only able to meet once a year on the seventh day of the seventh lunar moon of the lunisolar year. Considering the fact that Jirachi only stays awake for seven days, that's a pretty clear reference to that story. It's got something to do with genies as well, considering it'll grant people's wishes, which its name suggests as it's derived from Jin, which is an Arabic word that basically translates to genie. Now let's go ahead and move on to Deoxys. All right, so the other third gen mythical is incredibly simple to figure out. Deoxys is basically just an alien, and one that is clearly mutated in some way. Its name is derived from DNA's full name, deoxyribonucleic acid. Come again? Deoxyribonucleic acid. Very good. And its design, in its regular form, is clearly taking some reference from strands of DNA. 
There isn't exactly anything special about Theoxys with its origin in regards to being based on an actual myth or legend, but it's interesting to have one based almost entirely on science. Aliens, I suppose, are a myth, but really, I like to look more at Deoxys' relationship with viruses and mutation. Next, we have Darkrai. I am speaking like this for immersion purposes. Darkrai is known for chasing away both people and Pokemon away from its territory by causing them to experience awful and vivid nightmares. I don't know exactly how you can chase somebody away by making them fall asleep, but that's just what Darkrai likes to do. It just wishes to inflict mass fear in order to protect itself. They say Darkrai is not a dangerous Pokemon. However, what it's based off of is very, very dangerous. The term nightmare comes from an old English folklore legend of an evil spirit or an evil demon that would ride people's chests and to cause them to experience the worst dreams imaginable. Until they die. <laughs> okay, I'm done. I'm sorry. Darkrai may not be as mean as an actual mare, thank god, because that would suck, but mares in mythology are pretty dangerous. Darkrai is also based off of the Boogeyman. The Boogeyman was just a myth created to make the kids behave like a long time ago. There's all kinds of different variants of the Boogeyman depending on the culture, such as Sackman from Spanish folklore, the Baba Yaga from Russian mythology, and the Kappa, which is from Japanese mythology. The Lotad evolutionary line is also based off of the Kappa, and I cover that in another video, only if you're interested. Darkrai is also based off of Morpheus and Phobator. Both are from Greek mythology and both are associated with dreams. The... a mood. Okay, so like, Shaman looks like some sort of hedgehog chia pet, right? Ch -ch -ch -chia. I mean, quite literally, if you pay attention to Shaman in the anime when it's flower blooms, it just sort of looks like a bouquet. I think often of angels and fairies and whatnot whenever I see Shaman as its kindness and ability to fly when it changes into its sky form is very reminiscent of something like Tinkerbell or perhaps a fairy godmother. Speaking of that sky form, it's almost reindeer-esque. There's a lot of reindeer who fly in a lot of different kind of stories in folklore. I mean, just look at Santa Claus. We love Santa Claus. We have a lot of gratitude. Gratitude. There is also an ancient European myth that speaks of a magical constellation of a white reindeer and a hunter, and they're trapped in an everlasting hunt. But if the arrow ever hit the reindeer, the world would end. Up next is God itself. Arceus derives from a bunch of different cultures and legends. Arceus mainly appears to be based on a creator deity. One example is how it might be influenced by the Shinto gods, who summoned Izanami and Izanagi to create Japan. Arceus' tale in the Pokemon universe of how it created the Pokemon world is also a strong resemblance to the myth of the world egg. The world egg is a beginning, and some higher being comes into existence by hatching from the egg. It's a really interesting myth for sure. Arceus' design resembles that of a kitten. A kitten is a mythical hoof chimera-like creature said to appear with the arrival or passing of a sage or important ruler. A hooved chimera egg. Now that's a god. Very quickly, we have Manaphy and iPhone. I don't care. I know so many people make that joke, but I don't know it by anything else. The origins of these two come from manatee, sea cows, sea angels, all that good stuff. And I love marine life. I really, really do. But its name is the thing that points to mythology and folklore. Mana or mana, it's like a supernatural energy that can be expelled and some kind of power. There's all kinds of different things. I do wish that Manaphy and iPhone had a little bit more magic to them, but the name origin is still pretty cool. Next one we got is Keldeo. Keldeo is actually based off of a Kelpie, which is a Scottish mythological beast. The story for this one can get pretty dark, so I just want to go ahead and warn you about that. Like other folklore, there are different variations of the Kelpie. The most common description of one is a black shape-shifting water horse. They are usually found around or in the water, and they have been known to even be able to transform into a human. In most of the stories, whenever the Kelpie turns into a human, they still keep their little horse feet. So since they kept their hooves, a lot of people would get them confused with Satan or even other demons. Going back to the variation thing, some Kelpies were actually really good and just honestly misunderstood. Some were just lonely and craved human friendship. But then there's the dark ones that just enjoyed to lure their prey into the water so they can drown them. The dangerous ones would take their prey into the water, eat them very messily, and then throw the remains to the water's edge. One of the most popular scary stories of the Kelpie revolves around children. A group of kids were excited to see the creature and wish to play with 
with it in the water. One little boy tries to pet the horse, but his hand gets stuck to its slimy skin. Unable to free himself, the little boy is dragged underwater, and then the rest of the kids are also drowned. Their remains were found at the water's edge days later. The other version isn't really that much better either. In another variation of the story, the little boy actually chops his fingers off to free himself from the Kelpie. He manages to escape, but the rest of the kids unfortunately do not survive. That sounds like a freaking saw trap right there. On a brighter note, Kodio is also based off of the Kirin, which is a mythical chimera creature. Some variations of this creature can walk perfectly on water. Kodio takes a little bit of inspiration from the Three Musketeers, the character D'Artagnan. He happens to be the youngest addition to the group, and while it's not mythology, I still think it's super cute. This next mythical right here is one I'm sure not a lot of you know the origin of. Meloetta is based on muses, who in ancient Greek mythology are the goddesses of inspiration for artists such as writers, performers, and musicians. As stated in Pokemon White, many famous songs have been inspired by the melodies that Meloetta plays, taking us back to its mythical origin. As we can see, it's clearly based on the musician's inspiration for Meloetta's headpiece, being a treble clef and its flowing hair looking exactly like a stav or a music sheet if you will. Its hands also look like individual notes. Meloetta's name might be a combination of the words melody and pirouette. My brain goes immediately to the muses from Hercules. I would totally play it if I wouldn't get copyrighted, god dang it, but meh. Alright, so to close out the fifth generation's mythicals, we've got Genesect. Genesect is definitely a Pokemon that really is self-explanatory, sort of like how Deoxys was. Genesect is based off of the absolutely gigantic bugs that were walking this earth like 300 million years ago. That pretty much makes it as old as the common cockroach. Its armor, that Team Plasma puts on it, gives it a very close look to alien-made robots in a lot of science fiction. It looks like sort of a robot you'd see in a mecha anime of some kind, like Gundam. I love Gundam, and I loved Zoids, man. Getting into the Gen 6 mythical Pokemon, we have Diancie. Diancie is based off of a carbuncle. This is also a name of a bacterial infection, but we're not gonna talk about that right now. There's not really too many stories about these guys compared to other strange sightings like the Bigfoot, Loch Ness Monster, or the Chupacabra. The first sighting of a carbuncle was by Spanish conquerors during the 16th century. The legend became kind of popular and everybody tried to find one so they can steal the jewel on their foreheads. Nobody was ever successful. Volcanion appears to be based off of the Rikuyu and Shisa, or Komainu. Arcanine is also based off of these deities as well. They appear in both Japanese and Chinese mythology as guardians that invite good spirits and repel evil ones. This origin makes up quite well based on how Volcanion acts in the movie Volcanion and the Mechanical Marvel. Its name origin comes from Volcano and Lion, or possibly Volcano and Canyon. Its design, however, shows the arms looking a lot like cannons from a tank and its main body looking similar to that of a steam engine. I was kind of excited about the next one because it's just crawling with mythology. But anyway, the next one we have is Hoopa. So Hoopa Confined is your standard gen, and Mystic talked about gens a little bit earlier, so we don't really have to get too much into them. But I can say that the Disney movie Aladdin made gens pretty popular because of the genie character. We love you. But let's get into Hoopa Unbound. Hoopa Unbound is probably one of my favorite design Pokemon out there. It's honestly just badass, and it takes a lot of inspiration from Hindu mythology. There's many Hindu deities that made Hoopa come to life. And Shakti is probably the most major reference. Shakti is a gigantic deal, and it represents the mass cosmic energy and the main dynamic force that are even thought to move the entire universe. There's so much pretty art of Shakti, and usually we do see it with multiple arms, and Hoopa and Bound also has multiple arms. But not only Shakti showcases this in mythology, the Jijinis, which are very fun to say by the way, are also deities with multiple arms. The Jijinis were a six-armed giant that were written to be very powerful warriors in Greek mythology. That's pretty cool. The rings that Hoopa has can also be a reference to Naja, which is from Chinese folklore. They also possess rings that can seemingly act like portals and cause all kinds of magic, causing storms and tremors and all kinds of havoc. All of these are just so fun. Magirna is based off of the Karakuri puppet and the moon rabbit legend that originated in China. Magirna similarly takes origins from old nursemaids back in the medieval ages. However, where things get really interesting is when we note the bunny ears and the yellow crescents on its body. Those features are definitely a possible reference to the moon rabbit, which is a mythical figure which supposedly lives on the moon, in far eastern folklore like in Japan. 
The rabbit is seen with Mortar and Pestle, and in the Japanese tale of the moon rabbit, the creature is pounding the ingredients for mochi and other rice cakes. Coming up next, we got Marshadow. This is a very adorable little dude. Ironically, this Pokemon already has a myth like Pokedex entry. Its son Pokedex entry reads, able to conceal itself in shadows, it never appears before humans. So its very existence was the stuff of myth. Getting into its actual design origin, Marshadow is actually based on the Munahune. I 100% butchered that and I am so sorry if I'm saying all of these names incorrectly. These little dwarf guys were actually a part of Hawaiian mythology and they were pretty introverted. They just wanted to be by themselves, live in the mountains, in the hidden valleys far far away from other people. And that's basically identical to how Marshadow is in the Pokemon world. They come out at night to make artistic masterpieces but if they happen to mess up or fail they'll just abandon it and that's also a very big mood. No one could actually see them except for little children or even humans that have connected with them. They just want a friend. And Marshadow just wants a friend. The fact that Marshadow is also a fighting type leads to its other inspiration, night marchers and shadow boxing. Night marchers are the deadly ghosts of ancient Hawaiian warriors who died in battle. People who are living have to be very, very careful and respectful to these ghosts. If they hear them chanting, hear them marching, basically you have to put your face on the ground and show them respect. If they feel like they're being disrespected, they may hurt you or even kill you. So show those warriors all the respect. So, look, I know I said during Genesect and Deoxys that they were pretty obvious an explanation of what they are, but man, it honestly doesn't get more obvious than Melton and Melmetal. Melton is literally a hexagonal nut, <laughs> and I ask you not to laugh at that. Oh. And it's stuck to a body made of room temperature mercury with a tail that's just a couple of exposed wires. It's sort of like Melton was just made by someone who broke a glass thermometer in their toolbox. It might have been an electrician's toolbox, considering electricity plays a big part in helping Melton keep shape, despite having a body made of liquid since mercury conducts electricity. As for Melmetal, I think there is some potential in saying that it's based sort of on a Cyclops in a way, especially when a Gigantamaxes. That's a bit of a stretch, I can admit, but honestly, I wanted to say something about Melmetal here, since it's basically the same as Melton, but bigger. The next one is that two-legged kitty cat. Little kitty cat man. Zora Aura time! I feel like I say that wrong because of Zoroa. I just get so tempted to say Zoroa every single time. Why didn't they name it something else? So Zora Aura takes a lot of inspiration from a lot of different things. Obviously it's a cat, but the main thing, it's based off of Kanahikali. I feel like I said that wrong. Is it Kanahikali? Hanahikali, Hanakikali, Hanakikali, Hanahikali. That's fun to say, what the f- This is basically the Hawaiian god of thunder. We don't really have too many fun stories about this one, and I really wish that I can find more about that, but I can at least tell you that they're also referencing the Raiju, which is a Japanese mythological creature that is the embodiment of lightning. We usually see them represented as cats. Raiko, or Raiku, is also based off of one of these guys. There is a little bit of inspiration from the Kama Itachi. I could also make a Thundercats reference, because why not? And now we are to the final mythical Pokemon. It's been a long ass video, hasn't it? Next we have Zerude. And we're not gonna make any sandstorm jokes. Nope, 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 no we're not. Zerude is the newest addition to the mythical Pokemon. Yo, is it actually Zerude or is it Zerud? And honestly, I love this one, mostly cause we get a classic scary story. Zerude, or Zerud, or whatever, may be inspired from the Karoo ape, which is a freaky ghost ape that haunts the Karoo castle in Wales. There's other ghosts within this castle, such as the white lady, who slowly roams the corridors of the castle. Hundreds and hundreds of years ago, Sir Roland Reese, who lived within the Karoo Castle, had a pet ape. He gave him snacks and polka puffs. <laughs> Long story short, Roland's son banged a merchant's daughter, and her father was not very happy with it. This man's name was Horowitz. He came up and yelled at Roland for allowing his son to elope with his daughter, and the argument apparently got very, very heated. Roland's solution was to stick his ape on him. The ape literally tore this man to pieces, savagely mauling him, but somehow Horowitz managed to escape. As he was running away, apparently this man had some powers. He cursed Sir Roland and wished the same fate onto him. He wanted Mr. Roland to experience the pain that he felt. Hours later, very, very loud, blood-curling screams were heard from the tower. The servants rushed to go see what was going on, and they saw that their master was lying in a pool of blood. His throat was completely ripped open, and the entire room was just painted in blood. Horowitz's curse turned the ape against his own master, and then died shortly right after the attack. 
That's so sad. But anyways, the ghost of the ape came back. People say that they can hear the long howl of the ape. Very loud screeches going all throughout the castle. It likes to perch right on top of the castle, even climb the stairs. You gotta be very careful so your booty don't get destroyed. Zerude is based off of the Shug Monkey. This is kind of like a dog monkey ghost thing that haunts around the streets. This thing is honestly terrifying looking. I have never heard of these things before. This is a part of English folklore. Anyways, these guys like to just very creepily walk on their hind legs, follow people, chase after people on all fours, and just really make people cry. <laughs> But anyway, those are all the mythical Pokemon. I know this was a lengthy video, but this was so much fun. Thanks a bunch for having me on, Tricky. Eek. This was actually a blast delving into these mysteries. Reminder that over on my channel, Tricky and I rank the mythical's weakest as strongest. So go check that out if that's up your alley. So go down to the description below. Be sure to like and subscribe if you enjoyed this video. I love you. I'll see you guys in the next one. Bye-bye.